praise you father we thank you we thank you for the feast of tabernacles we thank you for the feasts we thank you for the body who is able to come father those going home today tomorrow or on wednesday we, we pray for safety for them father we thank you that we were all get, able to get together to lift one another up father to be to energize one another so when we go back to work this week next week whenever it is father we are ready to, to go back and be energized and, and keep firm in your word, Father. We thank you for your son, Yeshua, and we praise you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right, shalom, everyone. Do you guys believe that today is the last day of the feast? I mean, it's not the last day of the celebrations. That's tomorrow. But it is, we are commanded to festival for seven days and then to have the last great day, which is, brings us to a total of eight days. You know, and it's pretty awesome to be commemorating um, a, a, an event that just about every scholar uh, believes occurred at this time, which would, have, which would have been that our Messiah was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he was circumcised on the eighth day, as commanded by our Father. So that's pretty awesome that to know that we are we are very well witnessing his birth, and uh, we come, of course, to uh, a time to tabernacle, and we're looking forward to the time when he will tabernacle with us. So I'm ready with this. Got my tic tac. Got some um, cough drops. My water is right here. See? And I've got cough drops. And I've got a piece of gum if I have to. I'm ready. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if I need something else, I guess we'll, we'll see what we can do. All right, why don't you guys join me in prayer and we'll go ahead and say, uh, say a blessing and then we can start with our message. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you so much. It's been such a wonderful feast of tabernacles. It's been a, a great opportunity to meet lots of brethren and enjoy lots of great meals and just really to be able to think about you and forget about what's going on in the world. And unfortunately, Father, there are some people uh, from the faith that are having have had some issues during the feast. And we know that uh, Brother John Sonberg, his uh, sister died today when they uh, unhooked her from life support. And so we want to pray for Brother John, who was here at the feast, and uh, he went to console his, his sister, who ended up passing away. Also, Father, we pray again for <clears throat> Brother Vince, whose uncle passed away uh, yesterday. And so we want, just want to ask that you um, continue to comfort our brothers. And also we pray for Sister Deanna, who is from Missouri, who oftentimes comes here to keep the feast with us. And her friend uh, drowned uh, yesterday as well. And so and we know that she's having a hard time. She's on her way to uh, Missouri, to St. Louis. And it's just a tragedy. And anyone else, Father, that we may not know of or other people may know, uh, we pray for them. And we also pray for all of the people that are here, people that have been anointed against sickness. Father, we ask that you hear our prayer. And we ask, Father, that you... Show us your presence by hearing our prayers. We know we're not worthy, but we know that you are worthy. And we ask, Father, that you heal the people that are here, and those that have cancer and those that have other illnesses. <clears throat> we just ask, Father, that you be such, a, uh, such, be such a tremendous witness for everyone to know and to say that they came here and that they received healing from you at your feast. And we just want to thank you. We thank you. Thank you for this message in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. All right, how many of you have ever wondered <coughs> what is my purpose? <coughs> you ever wonder that? What is my purpose? Why am I here? How many of you have ever said, well, why me? Why did he call me? Right? Mm. 
I think we all have that, that question. You know what's interesting, and I don't want you guys to be offended by this, because I'm not trying to offend anyone, <clears throat> just simply trying to clarify that in the Hebrew mindset, the Hebrew mind that never asks what's my purpose, but mostly what's my function. Now you know there's, there's a difference between purpose and function, right? It, it seems similar to us, and maybe in some ways it is, but there's also a little bit of the variance is enough for us to notice the difference. For example, if I was to say, what's the purpose of a hammer? Or what's the function of a hammer? The f hammer functions to pound nails, right? And to build houses. So oftentimes, <coughs> as we are being called and we're asking the question, why me? What's my purpose? What's my function? And the father has... Believe it or not, your function <laughs> and your purpose spelled out where? In your Bibles. It's inter interesting, isn't it, that the questions are always answered in our Bibles. And that's why it's important for us to read them. It's important for us to accept that he has a plan and that he has a system and that he, never, he doesn't change from beginning to end. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, if I was to ask you guys, and we, we rarely, uh, we, sometimes we don't want to think about Satan as being as an agent of the Father. <clears throat> Yet, that's exactly what he is. Anybody realize that? Even he serves the Father's purpose. All right? We think, oftentimes we think, well, Satan, is, he's on his own. He's doing his own thing. He's got his own power. He has his own will. He has his own desire. He, you know. But in reality, he has no power. And he has no control over anything except that which the Father gives him. So oftentimes it's hard for us to recognize that, but the, the fact of the matter is that Satan serves the Father. And he serves him at his whim, at the Father's whim. Satan is evil <coughs> because the Father lets him be evil. He is a tester of his people because the Father lets him test his people. We all know the story of Job. Right? And Job went to the father and said, here's Job. And so they had this discussion. And the father said, well, you can do anything to him except take his life. So even then, the enemy has a function. He has a purpose. And when we realize that in our walk of life, then it's a lot easier for us oftentimes to understand the meaning of the scriptures that sometimes can be a little conflicting. It helps us to understand who we are as a people, why we are here in Sterling, Illinois, because there's an answer for that. You want to ask yourself the question, why are we here? There's a, there's, a, there's a reason for that. Why are all the people keeping the feast and why are they pil doing pilgrimages to those different locations and different stations? There's a reason for that. And the answer is in the scriptures. So the theme of the um, feast is the tree of life. And you've already heard lots of great messages about the tree of life. But we can't really have a theme, the tree of life, unless we talk about that elusive olive tree that's talked about in the book of Romans chapter 11. It's kind of an interesting story there, right? About the olive tree the wild and the cultivated, the natural and the unnatural story there that the Father is telling us the story. Really, Paul is telling us the story. But actually, I want to tell you that it's not a new story. It's actually not a new story. It's something that Paul has had knew about from long, long ago. He knows exactly what, what uh, he was going to be doing. He knew how. And why we would be doing what we are doing here today. And so our purpose and our function is incredibly important. 
Now, I want to tell you that oftentimes, you know, we think, oh, my function is to raise the dead or to give sight to the blind or to walk on water, right? Or to repel evil <clears throat> with my super spiritual powers. Um, and that may be your function, that may be your purpose, but we need to be happy with the greater powers that we have of healing people and going to the Father in prayer. And we also need to be happy with the small functions that we have. Because it's in the little things, it's in the small details that you can find greatness. Because if he instituted you in the small things in the world, the unnoticeable where nobody notices you, you don't get up on stage and speak, nobody knows your name, nobody knows who you are, maybe nobody cares, <laughs> but yet you're still serving your ever tiny, small purpose on earth. You're as great as King David. And even if you're given something tiny that is just so almost invisible, and you serve that purpose well, you're as great as Solomon. You understand that? So when you're talking about your purpose and your function, everybody wants to think big. Well, I'm supposed to be running a ministry of thousands of people. I'm supposed to be healing, going to the hospitals and bringing people back from the dead. <clears throat> you know, your function may be something as simple as opening a door for a stranger. It might be simple as giving somebody a glass of water. All right. Nonetheless, we have to recognize that those little things <coughs> are powerful and important to our Father. <coughs> Extremely powerful. We also have to recognize one other thing. You know, we all want to be first in everything. <clears throat> we have this desire to be first, to get the best. <clears throat> Many of us want to be first in line at the chow line. You know, we want to be first in line at, we're going to go see a concert. We want to make sure we get in there. We, you know, nowadays we're, we're, we're so commercialized that even believers are going to the stores on Black Fridays and they're standing in their lines and standing, staying in tents, doing all those things that people do. I'm not knocking them. I'm just simply using that as an example of the fact that we have this desire to be first. But we need to be happy with second. It's okay to desire to be first, but we need to be happy with second. So if our father says, you're not first, you're second, guess what? Yes, father, you're in charge. I love you. If you want me to be last... I will be last. So if he wants us to go first, we go first and we're happy. If he wants us to be last, we are last and we're just as happy. So our condition of our heart is pleasing to the Father. Whether we are doing the little things, but we do them with, great, with goodness and with a condition of a heart that says, Father, it is your will, not my will or whether we're doing great things, or whether we're first, or whether we're last. Because we recognize that He is in charge. And we recognize that He has all authority. And so we're not fighting with each other, trying to better off one another, <clears throat> because we're all equals in the sight of our Father. But again, we have different functions and different uh, purposes. So again, like I said, we cannot talk about the tree of life unless we talk, also talk about the olive tree that is mentioned in the book of Romans 11. And how does that apply to us? Let's go to Romans chapter 11. We're going to read verses 22 through 25. <coughs> Excuse me, Romans chapter 11. As we're going there, um, I just also want to say and acknowledge the band. 
uh, the brothers from Peoria. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. They did a great job. <coughs> Today's one Psalm 33 Ministries. We say, we say this is their service. Maybe next year they'll be up here speaking as well. They'll just take the whole service, right? Now, wouldn't it be kind of cool to have like all the diff various groups that are from all over the, the state, the different areas, just come in and they each get a day where they lead the music and they have the speakers. You know what I'm saying? I'd be open to that, right? I really would be. I think that would be an incredible experience for all of us to have all the little groups and you know, everybody's in charge of maybe, maybe they're starting something today, right? Maybe for next year we'll get, we'll get working on that and invite the various groups and we just give them one day. And um, I think it would be very interesting for that. So I do want to thank them for that. And also I want to uh, acknowledge um, the, the, our regular band that's going to the nursing home today. They're getting ready to go to the nursing home and to spend some time with the elderly and to just bless them with music and praise. And it's pretty cool. I, I love the fact that we have brethren that are willing to uh, do that, to travel down, the, down to the nursing homes. And I mean, you never know who the Father has for you to meet unless you expose yourself to the, to the light oftentimes because you are the light and you're reflecting on the people and they're asking you questions where you are, who are you, why, why are you here, and then you can tell them about the faith. It's an incredible thing for me. All right, so in uh, Romans 11, verse 22, it says, after all, if you were cut out from an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, Paul there is talking to the Gentiles and he's saying, well, there's a mission, there's a plan that is orchestrated that Israel, because Israel is hardened, has hardened their hearts, they are continuously failing the Father. And so... <clears throat> I like the part there where it says, until the Gentiles has come in, and we're going to read another verse in a minute that talks about that. And, you know, there are people who say, well, all of the Gentiles are Israelites. And I remember um, when I first started on this walk, and the term was British Israelite. You guys ever heard that? British Israelite. You know, that's the term that was utilized a lot. And, and then you have a group called Hebrew Israelites. It's an African-American group, you know, because everybody wants to be Israelite. And I think it's, I think it's ultimately possible that um, Israel obviously went throughout the nations. And, and maybe it does mean that Gentiles are the, the Israelites that are being called into the faith. But I also think that there are really Gentiles, people that are not part of the lineage, as, as we see here, I believe that, that there are those that are going to be at the master's table and that are going to be saying, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs of their master's table. And I believe that those Gentiles, like non-Israelites, are going to be called into the body of Messiah because of their faith. So, we understand this plan, then I don't argue with people when they, when they want to tell me that, you know, they want to convince me that all Gentiles are Hebrew Israelites. I don't argue that. Uh, my grandmother was uh, Jewish. She kept the Sabbath as a little girl, she remembers. She, was, she told me one day, um, you know, if you understand the migration of the Jews, the Ashkenazi went to the north, and then the Sephardic went to the south, to Africa, and then down into Spain. And then Queen Elizabeth ended up kicking all the Jews out of Spain, and they ended up in South America. And then from South America, they migrated to the north and the south, everywhere. So when my grandmother told me that she remembers keeping the Shabbat, and she told me how she kept it, I was not surprised because I had done my homework. I had, I had done studies in the migration and the history of how 
the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. But that's only one. You, you, you got the Babylonian exile, right? You got the Assyrians, you got Persia also be, becoming. Then you got Alexander the Great also in his conquests and what he did with the Jews. Um, typically, he is credited with giving the Jews freedom to worship the Father as they wanted to. So in the Bible, when you read, and they say the, Hel the Hellenistic Jews, it's actually talking about the Jews that were from Alexandria, that were from Egypt, or Babylon, rather, I'm sorry. And uh, that, that's what they're called. They're called the Hellenistic uh, Jews. And there's a conflict between, even today, there's a conflict between, you know, I'm Israelite, you're not, and et cetera, et cetera. It's just some silly stuff that keeps going on and on and on. But it, that doesn't change the Father's plan, of course. The Father's plan is solid, and he goes through and does what he needs to do. But here, Paul tells us that Israel <clears throat> is an ancient olive tree. And that they are the domesticated olive tree. And then he goes on to talk about the Gentile. The Gentile olive tree, the branch. A wild olive tree is grafted into the domesticated olive tree. The domesticated olive tree has the roots, right? And the domesticated olive tree has the roots. It's the foundation. That's what the wild olive branch is going to get the nourishment from the domesticated olive tree. So Paul is telling us that the Gentiles, they're going to be grafted into the domesticated people have to accept the foundation and the root for which they are planted on. And so, <clears throat> so we see that our Heavenly Father has a plan and that His plan involves not just the Israelites but all the people of the world and it's pretty cool the way that He runs His plan. Now in Psalm 115 verse 3, it tells us that basically Yahweh does whatever he wants, whatever he pleases. That's Psalm 115, verse 3. He does whatever he wants, how he wants it. And, you know, we oftentimes have to, we sometimes put him in a box. I've heard, I hear a lot of people talking about how he feels. Oh, he doesn't like this. <coughs> or, oh, he doesn't like that. I'm like, did you ask him? You got an email where you can verify that? A text message or something? <clears throat> to clarify that he doesn't like this or he doesn't like that? Or is it that you don't like this? Or you don't like that? In Deuteronomy 10 verse 14, <clears throat> it tells us about the fact that it is the Father who chose Israel as his people. In Deuteronomy 10 verse 14, beginning in verse 14. It says, Behold, to Yahweh your Elohim belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet Yahweh set his heart in love upon your fathers and chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as at this day. So Yahweh delighted to choose Abraham Isaac and Jacob and Jacob. <clears throat> we know that um, we know that Abraham had two sons. You guys are aware of that, right? Ishmael being the eldest, which really technically um, he should have been the one that was chosen, but he was not because he was the son of a slave woman. All right. A Gentile, if you will. And Isaac was the son of the natural woman, Sarah. But she was the domesticated woman. So that's why the father chose Isaac, Yitzhak. He chose him to set the lineage from Abraham. Because she was the domesticated tree, if you will. Okay? And so he cut the branch off Abraham's tree 
and set it off and blessed Ishmael because he did bless him. But it was the domesticated tree for which he was going to do his work. He was going to utilize to spread his Torah, to spread his, to get the, his covenant, and for the people, for their descendants, then to move forward. Of course, we understand the story. Jacob came along, <clears throat> you know, Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had 12 children. So, in Romans chapter 9, Romans, let's go to Romans, we're already there, Romans, Romans chapter 9, Romans 9, two chapters back, looking at verse 10. Let's read, start reading in verse 6. It is not as though Elohim's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are Elohim's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had, or had done anything, good or bad, in order that Elohim's purpose in election might stand, not by works, not by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it was written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall, I, shall we say? Is Elohim unjust? Not at all. For he says to, to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I, I have compassion. So what that's telling us, again, is that, all, is that the Father has complete and full authority. You know, one time I said, uh, I was praying for this lady. She asked me to pray for her. And the prayer was, Father, if it is your will, please heal this sister. Now, she was offended because I said, if it is your will. Because she said to me, well, of course it's his will to heal me. And you should never say, if it's your will, you should just say, tell him to do it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but I can't, <laughs> I can't tell him to do anything because he has full authority. All right? You know, a lot of times I pray, Father, if, if, I am, if I am to be utilized as a tool for righteousness to bring people to your faith, please utilize me. And if I am to be, if I am to be um, uh, justified or if I am to be punished for whatever reason as an example, then do your will. Because ultimately, he's going to do what he wants to do regardless of what we say. Right? And so... If when we recognize that he has all will, he has everything under control, and all we have to do is serve our function and our purpose, then life is good. Life is really good. All right. <clears throat> so our Heavenly Father then <clears throat> began to cultivate this natural tree, this natural olive tree, with Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob, Jacob. And he goes on and on and on. But something that's interesting that happened along the way. Because somewhere along the, or along the way, um, you have this, this people, this, this people that impress, impresses the Father. Enough to not only graft them in, but to literally, and I mean literally, include them in the natural DNA of the tree that our Heavenly Father started through Abraham. Most of them are women. And I'm highly impressed with this, and you should be as well, that most of, this, most of those that were brought into and grafted in uh, were women. You guys all know Rahab. <coughs> She was a prostitute. I don't know how many of you know who her son was. Any of you know? Okay. Two, one person. All right. Well, it's going to shock you to know that Rahab's son 
was Boaz. Isn't that interesting? Rahab's son was Boaz, right? So here's this Gentile woman, this non-Israelite, that saved the Israelites and assisted in the destruction of Jericho, the seat of Jericho, who then joins the lineage, joins the line of, joins the tree, gets grafted in through the marriage through Salmon, and then is the mother of Boaz. So, so here, here we have this, the story of the olive, the uh, domesticated olive tree, with the story of the branches that have been grafted in at our Father's will. Right? And so what happened to Boaz? Same thing happens to Boaz. Okay? He goes and marries this Gentile. Right? So he is half Gentile, half Israel, but really, if you understand the grafting in, and we're going to talk about that in a second, how that works in the olive tree. And when you graft in, eventually you can't tell the difference between one or the other. Eventually, the olive tree, the natural olive tree, takes that wild olive branch. At first, it fights it off, but then eventually it takes it in. And you can, you can go up there, but you won't be able to tell, unless you know specifically in market, but nobody would be able to tell which brass was grafted into this olive tree because it becomes a naturalized part of the olive tree. So Rahab being the mother of Boaz, Boaz is completely, completely Israeli, Israelite. Completely. Matter of fact, he even knows the laws about the kinsman's redeemer. And when he comes in contact with Ruth... Right? He brings that up. He says, there's somebody else that can be your kinsman redeemer. It has to be because it follows in, in, in um, the, the order of age. Age of authority. That's why we should rise when our senior citizens either would come up here or they would walk into the room out of respect. And we need to integrate that and start integrating that into our messianic walk of faith because those respect measures teach our children it teaches us and it helps us when um when i was younger <clears throat> and my, my dad still does this my dad had the custom of any time that his older brother or older sister would walk into the room he would go up and greet them and kiss their hand because that's how he was trained. He still does it to this day. He doesn't care where he's at. He doesn't care who's there. Now, he, he, never, he didn't make us do that. Otherwise, Robert and Polo would be, you know, right here. <laughs> right? <laughs> they slap it. <laughs> they don't kiss it. But that's, that's out of respect. And I think when you integrate those little small measures of respect into a society, it helps, it helps that nation. Uh, in so many, many positive ways. But I want to talk to you. I wanna, let's read about Ruth for a minute. Because remember, Ruth was a Gentile. You know, her mother-in-law was Naomi, right? You guys know that. And of course, Naomi, Naomi's husband and sons had died. And she's ready to go back to Shalom Assembly. <clears throat> you know, because she's from Sterling, Illinois. Right? And... Um, well, she's, she basically tells her Gentile daughters, because that's where they were. They were in a Gentile area, non-Jewish area. He tells her Gentile daughters to go ahead and go and, you know, go find your new husbands and leave. But Ruth is different. Uh, Ruth says no. And in Ruth uh, chapter 1, let's see. Chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. I just want to read this for you. You don't necessarily have to go there, but I want to read this because this is, this is to me, is important. Because this is who we are, guys. Okay? This is who we are, and it's okay for us to, to be this. Ruth says to Naomi, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. 
Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your Elohim, my Elohim. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Yahweh deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she was grafted in. A wild olive branch <coughs> grafted into the natural. Then, of course, we know the rest of the story in the book of Matthew. Both women are mentioned in the lineage of the Messiah. Right? I mean, imagine that here's this, here are two women that are essentially non-domesticated Israelites and they come and they accept and they acknowledge the Father and His covenant and they become part of the Messiah's lineage. It's incredible. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56 verse 4. The fact is that the Father has a system <clears throat> and He's not leaving people out of the system. And we don't have to walk in this proud, arrogant mindset. As a matter of fact, we should be humbled by His will and desire to call upon us and to help us walk in this journey of faith. And it is a journey of faith. And it's a struggle nonetheless, but we are overcomers. You know, the, the name Yisrael or Israel means he who overcomes with the help of Elohim. So he or he who strives and overcomes with the help of Elohim. We're, uh, we're striving. We're, we're always striving. We're, there's, there's issues going on with, with our jobs, with our families, you know, with other people in the faith. We're always struggling. There's always something going on. There's our own desires, our own flesh. And yet we cycle through the feast every year as commanded. And that's incredibly important. Isaiah 56, beginning in verse 4. <clears throat> For this is what Yahweh says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. Now this is incredible important and pivotal because Yahweh had, had ordained that no eunuch would be in the presence of the temple. But here he's saying basically it really is about obedience, keeping my Shabbat and understanding my covenant and loving my name. It says, your people will be my people. Oops, sorry. <laughs> To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners, foreigners, who bind themselves to Yahweh to serve Him. Foreigners who, are graft, who graft themselves to the Father, to the commandments, to the olive tree. To love the name of Yahweh. And to worship him. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it. And who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain. And give them my joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This is what the sovereign Yahweh declares. He who gathers the exiles of Israel... I will gather still others to them besides those who already are being gathered. So here's the Father telling us, again, discussing the olive tree. The domesticated olive tree established on the root of Abraham and the foundations of the covenant. But some of the branches being broken off because of disobedience. And other branches that are wild of the wild olive tree being grafted in 
because of their obedience and for their purpose and for their function. So there are a number of physical attributes that the olive tree has that are spiritually paralleled. Um, for one thing, the olive tree, the, the olive tree is the only olive tree that can be grafted in the way that it is. Naturally, in, in most other trees can be grafted from wild to domesticated. It, the olive tree has a unique, um, the oil has seven uses. Seven. Now, does you guys find that interesting that the olive oil can be used in seven functions and seven purposes? This is seven, right? Because there's three kinds of people in this world, those that can count and those that can't. So I got to make sure. So, in lighting, in cooking, anointing, medicinal soaps, lubricants, and cosmetics. Those are seven uses. <clears throat> in horticulture, cultivated branches are always grafted onto wild, except in the olive tree. The wild can be grafted into the domesticated. Once the olive tree, and I think, I think it was um, Brother Duane one time gave a message on the olive tree, and I, I believe that they said the oldest known, like the oldest known in the world olive tree is over a thousand years old and it's somewhere in 2000 and it's somewhere in, it's not in Israel. I was shocked to know that it was not in Israel. I was expecting it to be in Israel, but it's actually in, it's in the Middle East, but it's not in Israel. But it was like, yeah, it might have been Syria. And, and they had like a picture of it. And they said it was the oldest. Now, how they know that, I have no idea. You know, maybe it's not. But it was an interesting study. It was an interesting caption. that said it was the oldest tree. Now, what's interesting about the olive tree, when you take a natural olive tree and you graft in a, um, a wild olive branch, guess what happens? that olive tree flourishes and you get 10,000% more olives when you graft in the wild into the natural. Now that's a spiritual aspect of what our Heavenly Father is doing with the people that are non-Jewish, if you will, non-Israelite, but they are keeping the commandments. You see, one of the functions that we have is that we are to be jealous, jealousy makers. We are to make the Israelites jealous of us and they are to be envious of us so much so that they come back to the, to the Father and the covenant. A lot of people think that you know, the Jews of today are keeping the Bible, but they're really not. <clears throat> they are, really are not. If you study what they follow, they're like a, many other religions. They don't follow the Bible. They follow their own rabbinical writings. Many practices that people, th people do are really based on man's opinion. They're, they're rabbinical. And so Christianity is not going to make them jealous. Christianity is not going to offend them. It's not going to make them look twice. Catholicism is definitely not going to. I mean, in their liturgy, they are more like, they're more Catholics than they are Jewish. <laughs> they really are. You know, when I was raised, uh, and I didn't know it till much later, but um, our dad had taught us a form of Kabbalah. And if you understand what, Jude what Jewish Kabbalah is, is basically mysticism. We were raised with that mysticism. So I'm very, like, now I'm very, anytime I see it in my presence, I want nothing to do with it because I was raised with it. And I didn't realize it was Kabbalah until 
Here I am wearing my Kabbalah bracelet that I've been wearing all my life. And I was embarrassed to wear it because Chris used to make fun of me. Why are you wearing that? Um, well, you need to take that off. That's silly. But I'm like, wait a minute. <clears throat> Why am I wearing this? Right? Because a lot of times we do stuff, we don't even know what we're doing. And so we ask, uh, you know, I ask uh, our dad, I say, hey, Dad, why do I have to wear this thing? And he says, we've, our people have always worn it since as far back as we can remember. And you have to wear it. It's a protection charm, you know, all kinds of craziness. But then one day I saw um, in um, a very factual, you guys probably read the magazine, you guys I'm sure probably purchased it. It's called the National Enquirer, based on truth. It was a 1980 CNN, right? <laughs> and uh, here I see a picture of Madonna wearing this thing and it said that she was in Kabbalah and there I am at the store looking at that and looking at my wrist and we had it on the same wrist by the way it was on the left wrist and then I was more intrigued and it was until later on that I studied it and what I thought every Catholic did I came to find out it was really just us what I thought was Catholicism was really a form of Kabbalah a lot of mysticism and so I've always been, ever since then, I go against mysticism because mysticism is based on superstition. Superstition is what a lot of you guys used to be in. And a lot of your, your, um, your descendants were in superstition. It's not so much so anymore. Like nobody worries when a black kid, you know, walking under a ladder. All, you guys know what I'm talking about. But it used to be our, our your heritage was very superstitious at one point in time. Your great, great, great grandpa, you can probably even ask your grandfather, tell me about some of the superstition that you used to have. And, and it was very much alive. It's not so much so. We're not teaching our kids those things, and that's good. But that's basically what it is. It's a type of Jewish mysticism and very, very superstitious stuff and lots of rituals and all kinds of craziness that, that we were a part of that I thought it was just normal because that's just all I knew. But it wasn't until... I started walking in Torah and then learned about Kabbalah and then studied Kabbalah that I realized this is the stuff that we grew up with. Because I tell my dad that and he thinks I'm crazy. You're crazy. That's not Jewish. I'm like, Dad, this is Jewish stuff. We sh we sh you know, this is what you're doing. Of course, he doesn't believe that. But anyway, there, goes, there you go. Another thing that happens to the olive tree is that it literally strengthens it. Okay? Like it literally, a, a, if you want a domesticated olive tree to have a long life, you have to graft it with a wild olive branch. You have to. If you don't, it will not have the kind of life that you'd want it to have. So not only does it flourish with olives, but it also lives longer. It's healthier. Its DNA is in vastly improved when you graft it, when you graft the wild olive tree into um, into the domesticated olive tree. Now, the, the important thing, of course, is that you can't just graft any, any branch from a wild olive branch. You can't just be like, okay, I think this is the one I'm going to pick. You have to pick one that is healthy. Right? Now, health is paralleled with obedience to the Father. Health is paralleled with walking in the Ruach, accepting the covenant. And and then you have to pick the ones that are not also healthy, but strong. Because that strong branch will literally affect the domesticated olive. And it'll change it. And it'll pass on the good qualities of the wild olive branch. Those, those, strain, those strong, healthy genes, those good qualities. And so that's who we are. We are the wild olive branch, many of us. We are... To follow the Father, we are to obey the Father, we are to be closely connected to Him. That's why we, we, we come out in September when the people are driving by and they see tents and they think, those people are strange. Because who would set up tents in September when the temperature is 34 degrees? They're crazy. But you see, you're not crazy, you're strong. 
You can only do it if you're a wild olive branch. The domesticated trees, you know what they're doing? They don't do anything like this. They build little huts outside their home. That's what they do. They don't have to worry about the weather. They don't have to endure the cold. They don't have to travel, or they don't. The wild olive branch is showing the domestic olive branch what it takes to keep the feast, even in the feast. Because I know you guys seen pictures on Facebook. You know, in Israel, the Jews, they, they build little wooden huts, and they don't sleep there, by the way. They only eat there. They only have their meals there. They're not really keeping tabernacles as commanded by the Torah. But here we are, people from all over this state and others, coming here, setting up our tents, pulling our RVs, paying for gas, being with a bunch of other people we don't like. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> being with a bunch of other people we learn to like, coming with many different opinions, coming with many different things, and we're sleeping in the cold, We've got tornadoes coming by, and we're all sitting here with smiles on our faces. Why? Because you're a wild olive branch, and you deserve a round of applause. All right? You're not, say, you're not making excuses. You're not saying, I will, we will just do this and do that. You know, I got to pick on the max for a little bit. They, they, earlier on, they said, yeah, we're only going to come for certain days. And they've been here throughout the entire feast. All right, let's give him a round of applause. Why? Because you're a wild olive branch. Because you are a pillar amongst the faithful. You are to represent. You are to go through the wilderness. You, you're the ones that represent true faith. You're the ones that have been given the spirit to uphold the banner of the Father. And many of you would be the ones that would challenge the battle and go at the very front. To give your lives for the faith. And you wonder what your purpose is. And you wonder what your function is. You're doing it. But you do it when you keep the Shabbat. As strict as you can do it. When the Israelites are, when, when the Jews are, are making their laws, their man-made laws to do different things. Or oh, hire a goyim to come and turn the lights on and off. Hire a goyim. We're saying we don't do that kind of stuff. That's silliness. We are the foreigners. Yes, many of us are Israelites, of course. But by all accounts, we're being counted upon as Gentiles. And we're the example for the tree that is not wild. And we're being the example for them, and we're showing them the way. And you should be very proud of who you are, very proud of your children, even through the struggles that they are encountering. In Luke chapter 21, verse 24, here he's talking about, this is Yeshua speaking, <clears throat> and talking about this time, of what, why, we're, why this is happening. It says, They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We already read that. From in the book of Romans until the time that the Gentiles are fulfilled we are doing this we are doing this it tells us in Romans 25 Romans 11 verse 25 we are doing this because we are the ones that are chosen you're the ones that are called and your purpose and your function is to be an example to be a light unto the nations of how you are to obey the Father and carry His name on your foreheads and the covenant in His heart, despite hardships, despite tornado alerts, despite cold, and despite heat, and despite, well, not hunger, because I'm telling you guys, I think all of us have gained 20 pounds. But if there was hunger, we would be there. Romans 11:25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn unrighteousness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. That's right. 
So we are, we are the enemies of Israel at this point in time. Not literally enemies of fight, but we're enemies of faith. We're the representation. We are showing them the way. They will look at us as we continue to grow in number because we are the fastest growing religion in the world. And they will look at us and all of a sudden contend and say, wait a minute, who are these people? Why are they going on pilgrimages? Why are they traveling to honor and to obey? Why are they using the Father's name freely? Why are they calling upon him without fear? Why are they experiencing turmoil in their lives and they're being ridiculed? And here they are, being our example. Let's look at Romans 11, verse 25. Oh, I'm sorry, Romans 11, verse 28. It says, As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are your enemies. They are the ones that are not following the Father at this point in time. We have been grafted in. The, our root is Abraham, so that, the, so that the natural olive tree can look at us and say, what are these guys doing? And we agitate them, we make them angry, and we make them jealous, and eventually they pick up the banner. We're literally saving Israel, guys. That's what we're doing. That's what our function is. It is to save Israel. And what did Rahab do? Rahab saved Israel. Rahab saved through, uh, he, they, she saved the, the two witnesses. Remember the two guys that were in there? See, the pattern is consistent. If you, if you know how to read your Bible and look for systems and patterns, you find the pattern. Rahab saved men. We are to save Israel. Right? That's, what, that's why we are being grafted in. That's what we are to do. Your purpose is to obey. That's it. Your purpose is to obey your function is to obey. You were called to obey the Father of heaven and earth and to have his name and his testimony in your hearts and in your minds and to have the feet walking in the way. That's it. And then he takes care of the rest. You're a very special people and I don't say that very lightly. You really truly are a very special people. Romans eleven twenty eight. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For Yahweh's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to Yahweh have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of Yahweh's mercy to you. For Yahweh has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of Elohim. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of Yahweh, or who has been his counselor, who has ever given to Yahweh that Elohim should repay him. For from him and through him and to him all things are all things to him be the glory forever. Hallelujah. That's our job. That's our job. <clears throat> That's your purpose, guys. You, want, you don't have to ask anymore, what is my purpose on earth? My, your purpose is to obey, and your function is to make jealous and to save people. Your obedience saves people. Your obedience restores a nation. That's pretty amazing. You know, it's not, again, it's not a light thing. It's a big thing when you think about it. And I find it intriguing and amazing. And I'm looking forward to the fulfillment because it says until the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, until the Gentiles create such a havoc on the earth, create such a tumult on the earth, they create chaos, not in a negative sense, but in a spiritual sense, that they can look at us, and not just they, but others who are not following in the way, who are not following in the Torah, can look at us and say, we need to do what they're doing. We need to follow what they're following and move people into action. 
So your purpose is to obey. All right, we're getting ready to wrap it up here. Just a couple more scriptures. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17... Of course, everybody knows that one. That's where you, people say that Yeshua came to do away with the law, but we know that that's not what it says. But I want to start reading in verse 19. It says, Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So our purpose, guys, is to do two things. To obey and to do it in such a way that it's greater than the priesthood. Is that possible to do? Absolutely. Our righteousness should surpass that of the teachers of the law. That's because when we obey without excuse, we simply obey without excuse, we're doing exactly that. You know, the rabbinical laws have taken away the, the, the connection that they have to the Father because they've implemented so many things, so many rules, right? And those rules eventually end up keeping you away from the Creator. So you have people reading the Talmud, reading all those other Jewish books more than they read the Bible. And they go by the, by the rabbinical writings more so than they do what the Father tells us. And so eventually you get the schism develops where you're studying books that are not connected to the Bible, you're following things that are not connected to the Bible, and you start to depart, and there's a greater distance between you and Him. But we follow the Bible. We don't follow a man right? I mean, we have order, we have leadership and order, but we don't follow a man. We go check everything out to make sure that, that everything we're doing is scriptural, and then we follow the scripture. When in doubt, follow the scripture. You, you're not going to go wrong, even if you're wrong, because the Father will come and correct you. All right, last two scriptures. In Ezekiel chapter 37, talks about two sticks. I want to break down those sticks for you. Ezekiel 37. It says, verse 15, The word of Yahweh came to me, Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it Ephraim's stick belonging to Joseph and all the house of Israel associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. When your countrymen ask you, won't you, won't you tell us what, what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick, meaning them, making them a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. So here you have two sticks, one of Judah, one of Ephraim. Why Ephraim? And how is this important to making them one? Well, you take one olive tree, you take one wild branch, and it becomes one with the olive tree, the common olive tree. It becomes one, inseparable. Now, who was, um, who was Ephraim and Manasseh? Joseph's sons, who were they? Who was their mother? An Egyptian woman. That's why there had to be two sticks. One is the natural stick. The other one is the stick that is connected to the wild olive branch. You put him together. And what happens? He's bringing it all back home. He's, 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 he's using all of this to save humanity. And it's a wonderful thing. Last verse. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. But Messiah has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Messiah the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him 
then the end will come. When he ends over the kingdom to Elohim the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and authority and power. At the end of the age, <clears throat> when it's all said and done, we would have been part of this prophecy. We. Because we are those that the Father is using to, to reinstate his kingdom and bring Israel back to their state of holiness. And you should be very proud of that. Continue to obey. Continue to follow his word. And Yahweh bless you. Thank you.
I did this song last time, um, and when I did it, I was standing, so I almost dropped the ukulele. But that won't happen this time. Okay. I'm doing Salt and Light by Lauren Diggle. You 
a deep and wide I can soon me find Let my eyes see your kingdom Shine all around Let my heart Salt and light You are salt and light You are salt and light You are salt and light Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of how to praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, Sung by flaming tongues above. Takes us a mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Here by thy help I... I <laughs> and I hope by... Thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Yeshua sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of Yah, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a fetter Daily I'm constrained to be Let that grace now, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, yeah, I feel it Prone to leave the one I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. I seal it for thy court above. Come now, fount of every blessing. Tis my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy. Never ceasing, sing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy unchanging love.
but that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I'll do. Two things before I start the song. Number one, to all you who got up here and played, good for you. It is not easy. <laughs> I'm telling you, it is not easy. And I and, and I, I was closed my eyes as listening to you guys sing. I hear beautiful voices. All of you. So you all did an awesome job. It is look, I get up in front of our group every week, not this size of group, <laughs> but I get up in front of my group and it's still it's nerve wracking. So and we've practiced three or four or four or five times already so I mean we've had a little more practice in primosity so y'all did a great job number two who in here has a shofar get your shofar mine's back there <clears throat> so days of Elijah there is a part in there and you will hear it when it says shines like the sun at the trumpet call I want to hear you Yeah. 
year of jubilee and not of Zion's hill salvation come to the trumpets come on let's hear it Are we ready for the prayer for the food, or is there something else? We are? All right. All right, um, I need uh, our group. We do something a little bit. You might have heard us before, but we're just going to say the, the Hamotzi uh, prayer. Baruch atah Yoweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, Hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Meshim Yeshua, the true bread of life. Amen. Praise Yahweh for all things. You're dismissed. <laughs>